Let's start. Yeah. Our time timeline is fucked up completely, but so uh, we're going to the next speaker and our next speaker Andre Nestochkin. Yo. Should I look at the photo while they take a picture? Should I not? Uh, so, yeah, hi everybody, uh, I'm Andre. Uh, I'm talking about this, like my journey. Uh, what you should know about me, first of all, I love Ruby. If you don't, if you haven't seen my t-shirt, <laughs> yeah, uh, people love taking selfies with me. Uh, so, uh, I use it from time to time. Like I, sometimes I take part in this ICFP contest. What it is, it's a contest where teams of people across the globe uh, took take three days off to work on one single problem, and it's a very very hard and very very interesting problem. And in twenty eight uh, in twenty in twenty eleven and twenty twelve, I used Ruby during this. I had moderate success with it, but it was fine. And I gave a talk at Ruby C, and I had to write some Ruby code before, uh, in order to prepare for Ruby C. So overall, it counts as about like 10 days of Ruby in my life, maybe less. I checked Ruby C slides, and it was uh, number eight. So I don't know. Maybe I wrote some Chef since then. I don't know. I don't remember. Oh, like, does Vagrant uh, Vagrant files count? <laughs> <laughs> if yes, then I probably have like 15 days of that. I don't know. But yeah, uh, despite that, once I was offered a position as a software architect at a Ruby on Rails project, with uh, and I told them like I have almost no experience of Ruby, and they said, it's fine, we want you to join anyway. Yeah, but Golang beats Ruby even that, because I was offered a software architect position with zero days of go. <laughs> And at the time, I thought that uh, nothing can beat Ruby in that regard, but go bits, right? But anyway, I love Ruby. I love Ruby community, Ruby meditation. Uh, very happy to, to be here once again. Yeah. So my journey as a developer started a bit earlier than that, but 2007 was the first year I was actually paid to write some code. So that's where we should count from. So it counts at about like 10 plus years, like 11 plus years at this point, but who cares, right? So the math is about one day of Ruby per year, which is surprising, <laughs> but whatever. And 10 years is an interesting date, like it's an interesting period of time because for some people it's long, for some people it's short. When I was very, very young, People with, with 10 years of experience were incredible to me, right? There were these like demigods who's been there for so long. They've seen some like incredible things like, I don't know, first Visual Studio release or something like that, right? Uh, yeah, what was 2007? iPhone came up, came up, but where I lived, people were writing mostly PHP and ASP.NET used browsers like IE, Opera, and Firefox, and no one heard of iPhone at the time, right? Uh, in the internet, framework wars were extremely popular, right? Like Java people were fighting for their frameworks. I don't know which one won, I have no idea. Python people were fighting, Ruby people were fighting, JavaScript people were fighting, and today, they're still fighting, right? Who's here a fan of Hanami? No one? Yeah, one piece person, one and a half. Yeah, like maybe not wars exactly, but you got the idea, right? Yeah, and and ten years ago, like every like young developer, I was very young and very impressionable. Every new piece of technology was incredible to me. I, I learned a lot, and I was like a sponge. I was gathering all the information I could find. I was reading. I was uh, trying things out, and even before I started using internet, I was reading tons of books I could find. 
I had a Turbo Pascal and Delphi installed on my computer and I read all the docs. Delphi docs helped me understand component, uh, component object model from Windows development. If you know what it is, it's amazing. You can, you can have Microsoft Office installed and have Office like Word Editor as a component inside your Windows application and it worked and you can get a text from it and it was rich text and all that. Who needs writing their own RTF editors? I don't know. Like uh, a friend of mine gave me a JBuilder CD and it had like tons of Java documentation. I, I learned about a garbage collection at the time. It was also amazing. And another friend gave me like a disk of Linux distribution, like Mandrake at the time. They remain renamed since then, I don't, and I'm not sure whether this distro is even active anymore. But uh, on that uh, on that CD, among other th things, I found the PKX book, the first edition. At the time, like Ruby 1.8 probably was already a thing, or almost was a thing, but it was for 1.6. But it was still cool, because you could still write this like array.each, and then vertical bars, and it was amazing, right? So, uh, and I read tons of like folklore books, something that was not related to technology, like who here wrote, had, had, had read Just for Fun? Who here knows what Just for Fun is? Just a few people. So this is a book by Linus, Linus Torvalds, another like less popular than Marty person from Finland who wrote Linux, and he wrote this book about how, how he wrote Linux. Uh, other books like this, like the Mythical Man Month is an interesting book because everybody think, uh, think to, thinks today that uh, Mythical Man, Man Month is about like management and stuff, but actually like I think 70% of the book was about like technology of the time, like how they used microfilms to, f to make photocopies of the documentation. So like everybody could quickly find the documentation with these microfilms because they were small and the documentation was too big to fit into a library and stuff like that. Right, uh, I got to the internet very late in time, only in 2007. So this is probably strange, but at that at the time it seemed like uh, fine. I don't know. Uh, got my first rejection letter from Google, like after like seven or eight interviews or something, and I discovered blogs and read tons of blogs from Steve Yegi, from Joel Spolsky, to Kevin Dulles. Some names are more known, some names are less known, but I vividly remember how important the blogs were for me. Like, and I had this feeling like that there is so much to learn and there is so little time, I have to learn more. So as a developer, I was pretty, pretty horrible because at work, I would spend like an, uh, two or three hours closing Jira tickets and would spend the rest of my time just reading, reading, reading stuff, right? It was okay because I could close the Jira tickets in time, but probably my manager wasn't happy about me. And I cared about everything, programming, architecture, engineering practices, like everything that I wanted to learn I tried to learn, and everything seemed equally important, right? Uh, and it's strange, I read both blogs and books, but blogs were somewhat easier to consume. I think for people who join, uh, who decide to learn programming today, the best pl uh, place to learn programming today would probably be like something like uh, Instagram stories, or Twitch, or Twitch streams, YouTube world would be great like three, four years ago, today it's all Twitch, right? So like imagine a person playing Fortnite and uh, uh, describing programming concepts between the games, something like this, that would be awesome, I think. Uh, so Joe taught, taught me how to, uh, how to pass interviews, Kenneth, uh, uh, taught me the fact that databases are what's important about information systems and how people rewrite software around databases, but databases and data banks exist since, I don't know, 60s, 80s, 90s, and no company in the world wants to lose their data. And, th and they are fine with rewriting software, but usually like data is what lives for long. Steve, Steve Yegi at the time, uh, taught us 
that languages are important, not only in terms of syntax, but also in terms of what concepts they promote and how what styles of coding they promote, what ideas they promote. And he told me at the time that JavaScript is, is going to be the next big language. So I switched to JavaScript from Java since, uh, because of him. And more, more importantly, like Patrick McKenzie, taught me that I need to ask, when negotiating my salary, I need to ask for more. I need to, to charge more for my, uh, uh, for my services. And that was incredibly helpful, right? And then there was this stage of like middle developer or just developer or whatever developer where you like, first time you get to the, uh, in, I got in the company that had 800 plus engineers. And I was full of ideas how to improve the products we were working on. And I got uh, only one word back, priorities. We have other priorities. Our, our priorities are not allowing us to do what we want to do. Right? And it turns out that in order to achieve some goals, you actually have to sell your idea. You actually have to convince people. You actually have to talk to people. And moreover, other people are also trying to convince people around them. So you have to find for mindshare. You have to talk to more people. You have to have uh, d deep conversations with them. Uh, like if you haven't convinced them today, you have to come up with better arguments so you can convince them tomorrow in order to fight their, uh, to get your priority in the uh, into this priority queue right convince your boss was very important at the time right and today we call this all soft skills some people are good at it some people are bad at it i don't know it's hard to say and also another transformation that was happened uh, has happened in my life in 27 2009 i worked at the bank and my users were just next door. We had the, these two large open spaces. One open space was for developers, and the second open space war was for operations people. Uh, so when something, bro uh, when, when something uh, broke, they would come, out, uh, come up to us and just complain. And when we fixed it, we would come to them and, pro and they would praise us for this. It was, uh, it was uh, instant gratification before that was a thing, right? We were getting these pats on our backs, saying like how awesome we are, right? And then I moved to Opera and worked on a very, very long project. Uh, it was in development for two plus years. Hundreds of engineers across the globe were working on it. And when it released, we got like two, three days of press and then total silence. And it was very, very painful because we worked so hard and for so long on it. And on one hand side, it was pretty cool because hundreds of uh, hundred million plus people were using it. And I saw people on the street using the application I was working on, and it was great. But at the same time, I understood that I, need, I wanted to hear from users because I cannot work in this isolated environment for so long. Um, yeah, and... <laughs> Another transformation that was happening, it was 2008, and it seemed like server side is done. Everybody knew how to do it. Like, you got your routers, your middlewares, they would talk, you would send them your data transfer objects, there were controllers, repositories, entities, for those who write Rails, repository plus entities, usually active record, one thing at a time. But in general, it was pretty clear how to do that. Like mock repositories, task controllers, check which data DTOs you send in, check what DTOs you get back. That's, these are your tests. That's pretty simple. All right, got performance issues, add indices to databases. Uh, if it didn't work, add cache, whatever, right? So it was pretty, uh, pretty straightforward. But UI was in a turmoil. First of all, there were tons of companies who were thinking what exactly would be the basis of all our UIs, whether it's going to be HTML or something else. And there were tons of technologies showing up, like frameworks, libraries, stuff to write mobile code, stuff to write desktop code. It was, I don't know, I wrote some names that I remember, but I think there were like 
30 times more names at the time that I could name, right? The thing was that users speak UI. When you talk to business, they talk to you in terms of UI. And businesses, in general, they when they talk to you, they speak UI. So money was where the UI was, right? So uh, if I wanted to... Uh, uh, if I wanted to improve our financial situation, I had to do it the UI. If I wanted the company to be more successful, I had to pay more attention to the UI. So UI was a key, and that's how I end up doing more of the UI work at the time. Also, I switched to, lead, uh, to leadership positions and started doing more mentoring. And mentoring was pretty cool. I did some conference talks, some workshops, some community work. Like I co-organized KGS for several years. I got few people to come to Ukraine to speak at the conferences. I uh, organized a few of those. Uh, but leadership was strange to me because I used to be the person who was hearing no from other people. Let's do this. Let's add this kind of optimization. Let's try this technology. Let's do it differently. Uh, and the, I would hear no, right? And now I became the person who would tell, who was telling no to other people. And it was, it was strange because when I was telling no. I saw clearly why the no was the right answer. But when I heard no, I couldn't understand why they, haven't, uh, they cannot realize that I'm giving the right suggestion, right? <laughs> uh, so I didn't know how to lead. So my, my strategy to learn how to lead was pretty simple. See what others do and do the opposite. <laughs> Right? So in my teams, junior people were getting the hardest, the most challenging, the most interesting tasks. Like something that they would never even dream of doing, something that they wouldn't dare to ask for, I would give it to them, let them suffer, right? And I give, I give them ownership, like this task is yours, it's up to you how you will do it, just know that these are your deadlines, these are your goals, these are your KPIs, please do it. And I gave them freedom because I don't want I don't I didn't want to say no to them. And it was strange. Like at the end I want them to hear the to feel this sense of pride and accomplishment. And it's a reference for those who don't know, right? But me, myself, I was doing like boring mood tasks, some bugs, bugs that were showing up once in a blue moon, no one knows why, right? You have to like stay in the debugger for days and days trying to find out how, did it, how this could even happen, I don't know, and then figuring out how everything could work before I fix the bug, stuff like that, right? Yeah, because for me, it turns out, uh, my motivation was the motivation of my team peers. If they're happy, then I'm happy. And if they're proud, then I'm proud, right? Uh, some of the junior people, as you can see, were hating me, right? But eventually they got over it, right? But <laughs> and in my teams, I usually built teams that were very, very heavy on, like, on following, on loyalty, on commitment, on cohesion, they were communicating better with the, uh, with with each other because since I my answers were usually I don't know, it's up to you, they would ask other people in the team, right? So uh, usually, like this horizontal communication was very very good in my in my teams, right? Years later, some person wrote an essay, "Good tech lead, bad tech lead," and if you read it. That's how I lead, basically. And then it's in around 2012 or maybe 2011, it's really hard to say, I became what we now know as senior developer. I was told, I was called senior like way before that, right? But we all know that it doesn't count. I'm probably not a senior person still, I don't care, right? I haven't, I got the third email from Google. I haven't even replied to them at the time, just whatever, I don't care anymore, 
right? And for me, like the seniority started with uh, me doing tasks that were full cycle, where I start with like specifying what we want to do exactly, how we want to do it, then implementing it, launching it, measuring it, imp uh, measuring like impact in terms of like, I don't know, performance, new signups, whatever, and actually measuring revenue, like seeing the financial da data, seeing how my, I don't know, week of work earned me, I don't know, half a year of my salary or something like that, right? So this was very, very important because this gave me like the perspective in terms of business, right? In terms of product, in terms of features, right? So I could say that I made this thing, this small button, this small, I don't know, widget, I don't know, and I earned X amount of money with that for the company, right? And at that time, like engineering, architecture, TDD, whatever, it was all very moot because it didn't really impact that part of my work that much. So I was more agnostic about how we write code, right? So instead, what, what was clear to me, it was that I should optimize for a change. Like write some code, it may be ugly, it may be horrible, it may be suboptimal, but it's written in a way that later on people can come come in and change things, right? If, if an optimization is needed, we can optimize it. If a rewrite is needed, we can rewrite it. If, I don't know, a new feature is needed, we can add it, stuff like that. And back in my career, I had this horrible three months of nonstop uh, profiling of performance in Internet Explorer 8. There were like third party profilers that would gather in some data, but not like VML, which was an, X, uh, an XML uh, or an SVG equivalent on IE. So it was horrible, it was diff different, but you know, I've seen some shit, right? And you know, I've done some nast nasty things since then. And more importantly, I'll gladly do them again if it's important for the customer, if it's important for the company. And my view today is like, code can rot, code can die, developers can suffer, you know this saying like, machines should suffer, developers should not. Like, developers can suffer too, right? <laughs> and it's usually not something that, uh, like, making, uh, making something that is, seems impossible given the circumstances, given the architecture, given the like project structure, given the processes. Making it possible is something that I'm actually proud of. Like coming to the organization, telling, uh, listening to, the, uh, to their problems and then saying like, actually, you know, if we do this horrible thing here, this horrible thing there, and this horrible thing here, we can, launch this feature in, I don't know, a day or a week instead of six months or something. We can, uh, we'll have to like, we'll have to support this extra version of the API for the next half a year until those guys refactor this thing. And we'll probably never move away from it because no one needs to touch that code anymore, right? And it will be there and half a year from now or a year from now, people, new people will join and they will ask why this thing even exists, right? But today we can launch the feature and today we can earn more money, right? That's important. So my mind is despicable, it's an evil and it's genius, right? And it's not something that people expect from me, usually. When I come to the company, I'm this old bearded person, probably like uh, worked at very high profile companies, probably knows how to write clean, beautiful, well, well architected, well engineered code, all that, right? And then I come in and say like, we'll do this, right? So another thing that I noticed over time is that these older lessons that I got like, I don't know, seven, 10 years ago, they are coming back to me. And it's an interesting dynamic that I noticed, but like uh, understanding that data is more important than the code, uh, I notice and I see this survivability bias in tech. What does it mean? 
like if you have some technology that is still popular that was around for a long time probably it will remain popular and remain uh, relevant like uh, half a century from now and so it turns out stuff like i don't know regular expressions uh, c shell SQ, sql is important to learn and the early you learn them the more benefit you get over time from knowing them right and another no, another thing i notice is that most people are actually writing code on top of someone else's platform not in isolation there are companies like ibm like automatic the people behind wordpress or people from salesforce who are providing tons of apis tons of tools for other people to build uh, b businesses on top of them and some of these com most of the developers maybe 90% of the developers in the world are actually like company platform developers i don't know they call themselves uh, ios developers but they actually apple developers they call themselves i don't know react developers but they actually facebook developers but because they believe that everything that comes from facebook is awesome and they want to try reason if you know what it is right and Turns out some companies are better at maintaining their platforms. Some companies are pretty bad at it, well, right? Apple is a notorious example of the company that is very good at maintaining their platform. They had several like drastic transitions from one, from one process of architecture to another, from one API to another, but usually these transitions, first of all, there were few of them, like five or 10, I don't remember, and they were very very smooth some i don't know virtualization layers some automatic tools to migrate your api stuff like that on the other hand uh companies like microsoft and google they suffer from the fact that internal teams they often work independently and they compete with each other and these competitions these wars are bleeding through uh their pr and often you you have this feeling that you talk to some kind of schizophrenic person, right? That today says one thing and tomorrow says another thing. And too many, uh, as a result, they produce too many half-baked revolutions, too many things that were like, this year we start writing our applications in a totally different way. Next year, it's another talk like this. And it's a totally diff new way again, and it's hard to follow along. And as a result, if you are Microsoft or Google platform developer today, you actually suffer like almost every year. And I don't know why you do it, but staying independent is hard because your choice is very limited. Like Unix is our operating system. Some languages are great, like, but for example, if you're in JavaScript space, there is a high risk that you actually become this Google developer or Facebook developer these days. You, in C, uh, you can get into a Microsoft developer line of thinking, right? And for me, I chose this uh, like course to be uh, of violent independence. No matter what, I'm trying to stay independent from these companies, and it's hard sometimes because, you know, React. <laughs> right so i switched from java which was an a sun or oracle development platform to javascript i ditched this awesome uh, developer tools from intellij i switched from like yahoo baked ui framework to something that in is independent right and another lesson another story from all times is uh, this notion of 10x developer if you count those guys there are 10 of them Right. So 10x developer is usually this very experienced person who can do something in like half a day that a whole team would spend weeks on uh, achieving. Right. And when I was young, I thought that this is impossible. Right. People can type only so fast. Right. Especially when they use, I don't know, only 10 f fingers and don't use this, I don't know, EDs where in IntelliJ, for example, you can common space your whole application in like half a minute, I don't know. Uh, but over time I noticed that these days I make few bugs. I just do, right? And I use more tools to catch my bugs. Some of them are like stuff that I check myself. Some of them are like well-known tools. 
I can predict where the bugs will come up. Oh, we are doing this every day at 10 a.m. Like once or twice a year, we're going to have some time zone issues, right? I can predict features that will come up usually. And my code, like I said, is ugly, It's but it's ex extensible, so that helps. So if, yeah, if I'm wrong, I can quickly change stuff and no one noticed that I was wrong, right? Um, another thing that helped me understand becoming 10x developer is the fact that code is like X percent code, uh, software is X percent code and Y percent communication. They usually add up to about, I don't know, 95% maybe 90 percent what what's the percentage what it is no one knows right i don't know but over time as my communication goes up the time spent in writing code is going down so yes i write very few lines of code and get something done that a team of developers have to spend weeks on but that's because i talked through the task beforehand right and i talk a lot when it, uh, when a task comes I have to know everything, like what are the requirements, what are the scenarios that we want to actually cover, what are the workflows, what business is doing behind the scenes, why they need this button to, to do this thing, right? Uh, understand the context, when it happens, why it happens, how often it happens, and understand the roadmap. We're doing this not because it's needed today, but also because something else is uh, is what we're planning doing like i don't know two years from now and maybe based on what we are planning to do next we should rethink the task today and rework the requirements again and get to the point where we don't spend more a lot of time redoing it i'm asking why all the time I may be this like two year old annoying annoying or four year old annoying kid that asks why all the time. Mommy, where are we going there? Why? <laughs> right? Uh, we are to see and whatever, right? Why? <laughs> you know. And moreover, over time, as I become more experienced, I talk a little more, but people also listen to me because they think that I'm experienced, right? So I probably know what I'm talking about. So over time, it's easier to get my features into the product. It's easier to get more uh, to, uh, to get teams support my ideas. It's easier to influence the direction we take as a company. It's easier to surface my own accomplishments, like this thing happened because of me, and it's easier to be proud of what I'm doing because I can actually say what I did, right? And there is another like essay from Patrick McKenzie. He tells like, don't call yourself a programmer. That was another lesson that I learned 10 years ago, but it, it finally comes up like in the last couple of years. So today I usually call myself an MVP and that's what I want to be. It's most valuable professional, most valuable player, like the person who ch changed the game. That's what I want to be. And you know, like when people are looking for a good lawyer, a good doctor, a good financial advisor, or a good plumber, even they usually like care about the contact they receive. They usually care what kind of recommendations they get. They usually treat you well if you are really a good doctor, right? And I want to be a good MVP, so people know who I am, people know why uh, why they need me, and people respect me more, right? So these three phases, they didn't happen like in, like, I don't know, t yesterday I was a junior developer, today I'm a mid-developer. It didn't happen like this. It happened over time. It's a gradual transition. As my beard grows longer, right, as I lose more hair, this is happening, right? And uh, each phase is interesting in its own regard because juniors, they are full of ideas, they read a lot, they listen to many people, and they but they cannot apply everything they learn. They can only apply only few things. And it's a paradox of some sort because almost everything I learned and everything I talked about today, I knew about it like 10 years ago because I've read about it 10 years ago. Yet I thought that I was in a situation that most of that was not applicable to me in my reality. Like I, haven't, I was just a developer, just a coder, I couldn't be the person who 
can talk about money or whatever, right? Uh, who can uh, talk about like product features and stuff. Uh, today I can, but I haven't learned anything new in general. When I was in the mid, this is an interesting time where we are making choices. We've learned a lot as a junior people. We've, what, what did I do? What was that? Uh, it's a calendar, and it's a not a calendar. No, and it's not my presentation, and this is my presentation. Awesome, right? So, uh, like, and it's interesting because at that time, pe different people uh, choose different paths in their lives. Like we, everybody who started their careers in twenty o seven. We all knew that JavaScript is going to be the next big language because we were told about it. We we heard about it. Yet most people haven't ch uh, haven't chosen chosen JavaScript at that time. They decided to remain I don't know in Java, in PHP, in whatever. Right? Some people develop these soft skills very early in their careers. Others don't. And they end up being these like super awesome developers who sit somewhere on the back, never go to meetups, never no one heard of them, but they're doing amazing things on their own, just not talking to anybody, not teaching anybody. It's strange, right? And it's fascinating to me. And I want to learn more about how it happens. Because I want to learn more how from the same people we can breed different kinds of specialists. And my senior years were about solidifying the beliefs I already got in the past. I haven't changed my mind. It's just my mind was be becoming more sure of what I chosen as a meat person. And it became like about making a difference. Not just choosing a job because they offered me more, but choosing a job because getting there would bring me in a position where I could change things. Launch a new product. Uh, be, uh, making this product more useful, impacting more users, impacting more developers, I don't know, right? And that's going to be next 10 years, right? And today, when I look at people with 20 plus years of experience, it's also very, very fascinating. Because instead of talking about the jobs they took, they, talk, they often talk about the topics. Something that happened at one company impacted their lives in other companies. Uh, their stories, like my stories today, if I told you one of them, would be like spanning, I don't know, a few weeks, few months, maybe, right? Their stories often take place in terms, uh, uh, span several years while they are working in different companies, but the story continues, right? And their experience becomes wisdom. They can look at the technology, they can look at people and just have the right advice to give, right? The thing is, programming is never, never, never get bo gets boring. And in my 10 years, I've been doing tons of stuff. I've been writing Bash for a long time before, before uh, recently. I've been writing JavaScript and Java and C++ and stuff. And it never was boring. Like, no matter what I did, it was awesome. So I'm looking forward for my next 10 years. And I hope you look at your your next whatever years you have too because it's going to be great thank you